Andhra Pradesh and our own state, uh, there are four university representatives are here, and all of the elite people and knowledgeable people, and they have their own uh, experience in their. Uh, no, it is a mix of teachers, KVK, and uh, teaching. And all are having projects, extension work, and everything. It is a beautiful uh, group, and uh, also we can take many information from them also. Thus, I hope it will be an interactive uh, session. And uh, all our uh, assistant professors, or some of our assistant professors, or their associate professors, or even professors, as well as representatives are there. Uh, I welcome you for this program. She is uh, Dr. Jayasri, and uh, I hope uh, she is the first lady research person for, for this uh, training program. And uh, also, I hope uh, she is a veterinarian. Dr. Jayasri is a veterinarian. She is uh, graduated and uh, graduation and post graduation at Tarawasa, Chennai. And then uh, she came to Karnataka, so she is basically Karnataka. So then. Uh, she worked in uh, our own uh, Abile College of Agriculture as a teacher, I think. And I think Dhananjaya, Sahana, all are students of that. And uh, she handled the animal science course for about four years, if I am right. And also she served in eight to ten years in the Department of Animal Husbandry and Veterinary Science in Government of Karnataka. Uh, next, she got an opportunity to become an assistant professor in uh, Karnataka Veterinary and Fisheries uh, uh, Science uh, University, Bidar. Then seeing all be there, Bangalore and everything, at last she came to Shumaga because she, she loves Shumaga. <laughs> uh, so I think hopefully it's five years now, it is a five, six years she is in Shumaga, serving as a head of the department and a due for professor in animal genetics and plant breeding because that is the one of the subject which I am because, because I am also a veterinarian. I hate that subject because it is very fear, uh, I used to very fear about writing the exams because all DNA, RNA, breeds and everything are very difficult. Uh, so that is also one of the tough subject for Othlas, for uh, uh, Othlas students, uh, but it is a good subject for uh, uh, rank students. Of course, Madam is having experience in post-graduation, graduation teaching. Of course, she is handling uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, some uh, projects, also RKU projects and uh, some DBT projects. She <coughs> participated, participated in many seminars, conferences and she got uh, some of the awards also. Uh, of course, presently she is head of the Malnad Gidda Research Center in uh, Shumaga, placed at Shumaga. Uh, of course, she is involved in extension teaching and also research and that is the beauty of our uh, resource person. And again, she is very practical. She is down to the earth and she will start with uh, very minute things and end with the beautiful things. That is one thing. And uh, now she is going to talk about uh, the livestock and your natural farming. Of course, you know breeds. Breeds are our especially indigenous breeds. And what is the importance of indigenous breeds and what is the uh, importance of... Uh, nowadays we are all talking about good milk, bad milk. But there is no good and bad milk. That milk is depends on the only what we feed to the animals. Of course, there some protein structure or something else will be different. And she will talk about conservation of breeds and what are the breeds we have. And also, so livestock is important. As our Vice Chancellor was telling that we have to, without livestock, you can not go for natural farming. So if you see yesterday, day before yesterday, Bija Amrucha, Gana Amruta, there is a ghee, there is a milk, there is something, uh, desi menu, desi dung and everything, desi hasu, desi cattle, urine. So that will be the, become a big uh, source for your natural farming. Of course, she is going to elaborate all these things along with that because Malnad Gita is a prize breed of our Western God, especially Chikmangalur, Shumaga, Udupi, and this is called as a Western God, what you have seen in uh, Kemangundi. So from that side uh, up to Udupi, and Shumaga is a hub of uh, Malnad, it is called as Malnad. So Malnad Gita is a, one of the best drought breed. She will talk about value addition of what is the value, what is the value of milk and what are the products we can do with, with uh, Malnad Gita. So with this introduction, I welcome for this session Dr. Jayasri Madam on behalf of all the participants and KVK and all the organizers, uh, we are welcoming you Madam. So now the session is yours, you can talk, you can uh, discuss and everything. Thank you.
Okay, some the participants are there in online also. Participants will not be online. Other from uh, different colleges and students. Okay. And some uh, IIT group. Okay. Join. Okay. Good. No, they will be doing a uh, lively live. It will be going. Okay. Good morning to everyone. So I think you are all becoming natural now. So many natural faces I am seeing with the natural farming uh, practices. Huh? Uh, so here in my talk, uh, I am not going to bore you with the different breeds or explanation of the breeds, something like that. But in a nutshell, how you can, uh, just by seeing an animal, how you can classify or uh, to which category it belongs. That's, uh, that should be the thing of uh, any f farmer or any layman or in even an agriculture scientist. Okay, that will be my, th so in that context, I'll say how the breeds uh, have been adapted to the different climatic conditions or the agroecological zones. So in a brief, I will be telling about the different zones of uh, the country also to have a knowledge because all these are uh, like a chain, the soil, the geographical condition, the climate, everything goes together if a breed has to evolve or if an animal or if a particular species has to exist in a place. Like um, uh, you can see uh, a woolly sheep in the Himalayan ranges or a sheep in the Andhra Pradesh or some which doesn't have uh, much of wool on its body. It, that, is, that shows the adaptability. Likewise, the cattle also. You can see a tall draft breeds in the peninsular India, uh, whereas you find a large, uh, huge-sized breeds uh, which, ha which is having good milking ability uh, in the northern or the Gangetic Plains. So that is how uh, that shows the, um, uh, since, since time immemorial, uh, these animals have been adapted along with the selection by the human. Definitely the human selection uh, is also there because what he wants, he has selected. That is for the purpose for which um, he wants to have a particular breed or a, a species. So the intervention of these two along with the available natural resources, the breeds have been evolved. So let us see in uh, length about this uh, aspect. So when we say a natural farming system, one is the natural resources, the f uh, all the panchapuda, what we say, no, water, soil, air, everything is uh, required. Whatever is the panchapuda is uh, definitely required uh, for any living uh, species to exist. Uh, but then again, if the livestock has to exist, it needs feed and fodder. Feed and fodder, what it needs, what it can feed. So if you say the, a cattle, a buffalo, the sheep, or the goat, uh, these four species very commonly we see, uh, their feeding habits are very different. You say the grass, uh, the grazing sheep feeds on the grass, which grows just few uh, centimeters or uh, inches above the soil. Whereas the goat feeds uh, on the grass as well as the bushes, even a tall tree branch, it can just, uh, or it can even uh, climb to a, some extent to a smaller tree and eat the tree leaves. Uh, whereas the cattle, um, some they have the habit of grazing on all these as well as uh, what we uh, uh, do in the intensive farming system as a uh, concentrate feed along with the chaffed fodder or a dry roughage which is chaffed and fed. So like that the buffalo also has a, a different uh, method and it needs a wallowing tank. Definitely needs a space for uh, keeping its whole body inside the water. So the needs of these four species itself is different and again within the species the many breeds, their needs also again varies or their adaptability also varies. So that is why I put the agroclimatic zones which are required, that's these two together uh, con uh, forms the livestock genetic resources or the variability in the uh, livestock genetic resources. Uh, then, the, uh, of course, the market demand. The market demand comprises not only the marketing pattern as well as the consumer preferences. Even if it is uh, the farmer is not going to sell his milk or uh, the products uh, for his own consumption, what are the, uh, whether he can uh, use, he'll be happy with only the goat milk. 
you will be happy with only the cow milk or with the buffalo milk. So sometimes in, in some parts of Shimoga, we can see in villages, uh, I think it may be true in some other state also, uh, large herds of buffaloes are kept. So the buffaloes are kept as large herd, one for manure, another for the milk, from the milk they get the butter, especially the consumption of butter and ghee. Uh, but whereas if you go to the uh, northwestern side uh, of uh, India, like the uh, Gujarat and uh, Rajasthan, you can see large breeds of cattle, uh, their, uh, their preference is for cow milk. So likewise, um, the preference of the consumers also has a, a role in the evolution of the breeds. So that is how uh, these uh, four aspects are very much required. So what naturally what we are going to turn the uh, manure, whatever the excreta of the uh, dung or the um, excreta of the sheep and goat are uh, definitely a good manurial source which enrich the soil. So that aspect I am not going to touch because you are all agriculture scientists, you know uh, how much value it has. So the normally what, they, what a farmer says, uh, we give the agriculture waste to the animals. The animals give us the dung, which is turned into compost. So where it is not valued. But off late, what happens with the recent uh, uh, changes in the farming practices, everything is valued. So what, what is the cost of a milk? What is the cost of production of one kg of compost obtained or from the dung? How much compost is generated? How is the bulk of the compost is uh, going to be there? And what is the um, nutrient level in that compost? So naturally, whatever we are going to feed, it is going to excrete. So the, uh, there are uh, plenty of um, uh, microorganisms in the rumen uh, of cattle or sheep or goat. So what is that is going to come out and how it is going to help in the soil, um, enrich the soil. So that concept. So what you are feeding, what you are going to get back in the form of urine or uh, dung. So that also matters now because the value of the compost is going on increasing. And again, we have some farmers who are preferring to have the compost in a, such a compacted form so that they can transport it easily. So whether the compost made, uh, it, it may not be moist, it may not be totally dry also, but how you are going to transport that to different places. And we say the vertical, I think how many of you are horticulturists here, shall I? Yes. So vertical gardening or the gardening on the walls is uh, now upcoming, gardening on the roof. So how the manure or something, the cocoa peat or something prepared, no? we come across many farmers, they are just having a confusion whether to ask this concept to an veterinarian, to the veterinary university people or to the agriculture university people. When it comes to uh, this, you say the preserving the dung or making the compost, you may say you go to a veterinary college and you ask about that. Then we will say, no, the manure is required for an agriculturist. You go to the agriculture. And yes, definitely. Many farmers have come and asked us. Uh, then we say we don't do research on that. At, it is at that point of time when um, uh, Dr. Viresh and Dr. Shilpa, uh, we all uh, uh, contributed mutually through the, their project in that uh, zero budget farming project. So we gave the manure and they did a lot of research on different uh, dung and materials obtained from different breeds, uh, the cross breeds, uh, the pure breed, pure uh, indigenous breeds and what is, I think uh, she has done a lot of work and published some papers also. So that will throw light. Now there is a bridging gap. So this natural farming is going to bridge the gap. Uh, what is that? Who owns that? Who owns that comp composting or the manure part? whether it is to the animal husbandry people or to the agriculture scientist. So let us uh, move forward. So why these uh, animals are definitely kept? It is uh, security against climatic and economic risks. So there are a lot of surveys which have told, even when the crop failed, I think uh, people from Andhra Pradesh uh, and Telangana will be able to appreciate there are a lot of publications on that. Whenever there was severe drought, the sheep husbandry has helped them with the animal because they could not have a larger animal because the fodder was also deficient. But still they could sustain with the sheep husbandry or the goat husbandry. 
So that is why they say security against climatic and economic risks. So immediately uh, it helps to the waiting period till the next season comes for the crop. The farmer gets some money out of uh, the selling his animals or the uh, byproducts from the animals. Then it uh, it's a means of accumulating and maintaining financial reserves. Of course, um, uh, definitely the small ruminant plays a major role in that. When immediately they can sell, they cannot sell a cattle or a buffalo at one go. Whereas uh, the small ruminants as well as the poultry, if they want some money, immediate some death or some medical expense, if out of some 20 sheep, they can sell some 5, 6 sheep and get the money immediately for that. Like that's why they call us an automatic teller machines or ATMs because the small ruminants can be sold just to the neighbor and they can get the money. For 5,000, 6,000, less than 10,000, somebody will be having to help them. So that is why that uh, this uh, financial reserve, it is uh, like a bank for them. Uh, then way, it is a way of life. That's why we call it as a uh, uh, husbandry or agriculture. It is a culture, is a way of life. Because to have, uh, we are shepherds. They are proud to say we are shepherds. It is our ancestral occupation. We are rearing buffaloes. Because it is our, our ancestors have done, we are continuing to do. That is why the way of life. And uh, definitely against the disasters. Uh, when there was uh, uh, recently, even uh, two years back, there was flood in uh, many parts, no? Krishna River and all those things, Belgaum and all were flooded. The buffaloes were immediately, all the fields were flooded, all the crops have gone. But the buffaloes and the animals can swim and they can survive and they, the, they were rescued and given back to the farmers. So that is why when there is any natural calamity and these um, by their own nature, uh, they escape the natural calamity or they forecast the uh, natural calamity. Even in Himachal, uh, the sheep and the cattle which were, all, which were going on the flood were able to uh, like swim across and they were climbing up the uphill and you can see many photographs in those uh, uh, YouTube and all they have put that uh, these animals how they safeguard themselves from such natural cal calamity and immediately people living there immediately they can get the milk you know which is an animal protein which is required because uh, they can milk the animal they can feed the young uh, and the old people with the milk so these are all the advantages of that's why it is called as a it's a traditional wealth. It is called as a traditional wealth. So this uh, point, you know, grazing livestock plays a major role in shaping the local vegetation. So in uh, Kemanguti, I think you all had a visitor. You can see the Shola forest uh, where uh, while going to the, uh, on the way you would see tall trees. Then as you go uphill, you can see uh, plain grasses. That is the speciality of the uh, the Shola forest, where uh, these ha uh, these animals, while grazing, they have the um, uh, habit of feeding on such preference to feeding on certain uh, plants will give a shape to the vegetation in that particular area. So that is how uh, the agriculture and uh, livestock become independent, and it creates a life uh, landscape. A landscape which is um, uh, which is always um, like f the farmers or the livestock keepers know uh, where exactly if they go in a particular season they will get uh, the feed and the fodder. Uh, so they were they you can even talk to them and get the information uh, pre monsoon where they go to graze after monsoon uh, uh, during the rainy season. So they know because they know where the vegetation is existing. So let us just uh, trace back uh, to our ancient uh, mythological times or historical times. So we all, um, as a Bharat, we know that uh, this cow husbandry, a uh, lot of um, informations are there. Uh, of course, all these um, cow milk, gutter, butter, curd, and all those way, everything is used. Uh, in our puja or uh, daily uh, t uh, as a daily uh, thing and uh, they are considered as holy also so definitely then the cow husbandry or the animal husbandry should have existed some so many years ago also and it was available in such much quantity uh, they were able to offer to the god after they consume only they will offer before we, we, we do now before we uh, we do puja we won't eat but those days it might have been superfluous so they were using that for uh, the abhisheka or uh, something okay that is a way of thanking the god 
then again there are in the puranas also they have um, uh, mentioned uh, some criteria about the uh, selection so where what which animal has to be used for breeding that is uh, there are uh, evidences like the bull selection so an uh, offspring of a heavy milker so heavy milker who is the mother and who is the father of that so because the father or the bull is going to serve many animals so based on the daughter's performance that is a sort of progeny testing uh, they have adopted that is why over the years uh, we have certain breeds which are heavy milkers uh, then uh, they are capable of protecting the whole herd so such bull if you if they are going to select the daughters of a particular bull which are heavy milkers those bull is going to be considered as the 50% of the herd so then the rest all will be castrated it will not be used for uh, breeding they will be used for drafting so that is how the the evolution process has ha happened and again as soon as the bull calf is born uh, or when it is in the growing phase only so after two or two and a half years only they will be used for breeding because that they, those days definitely there will not be any other technology even now there is no technology like you cannot make the bull to grow faster you have to wait till two and a half years till it gives the uh, semen so but they are describing uh, the bull what are the characters it should have elevated shoulders big hump soft and uh, straight tail tender cheeks uh, broad back shining eyes sharp horns and excellent switch the hairs on the tip of the tail it should be lengthy see the the purpose of that the the, the hairs in the tip of the tail is called as a switch uh, the purpose of that is to drive away the insects drive away the house fly or the mosquitoes which sit on the animals so uh, you can see how c clearly they have mentioned that it should have a lengthy tail with a long switch Uh, because it should uh, that switch when it wags its tail it should come almost to the neck region so when you observe a cow you can see most of the time uh, the insects will try to sit on the face or near the nostrils and the and around the eyes so these insects are definitely carriers of many other diseases like we all know human gets um, malaria by the mosquitoes bite or a dengue fever by the mosquitoes uh, bite so likewise there are plenty of diseases which are transmitted from the uh, vectors that is the insects to the animals blood sucking so how this tail it, it looks like an organ just uh, but you, i don't know how many of you know about that it is used for driving the uh, insects away so because we all have hands to drive away or we can hold a fan and drive away insects but for the animals the tail switch is the a uh, fan to drive away the insects so these um, these things and i can see the bulls must be well built with roar like thunder even the voice uh, they have recorded and they should have a high stature and a graceful walk see this walking pattern of the animal is also very important uh, because uh, it is not only for uh, the beauty pageant Uh, where the walking is the walking of the animal is very important because all the four legs uh, should should stand firmly even on an uneven surface so even on an uneven surface and the hoof pattern so if you say a cross bred um, animal a hetch for a jersey hoof and the indigenous breed uh, there is definitely uh, a difference in the hoof pattern Uh, our indigenous animals will have the hoof uh, two portions will be there they will be placed so closer together so that it will have a grip on the floor with which it is standing whereas these um, cross breeds will have a wider gap so that's why they fall and more uh, injuries are there in the cross breed and uh, they cannot withstand the uh, uneven surface face whereas our animals can stand climb up the hill can jump everything uh, they do because of the sturdiness of the hoof and the firmness of the legs in which it stands so these are all um, some of the important characters which we have to uh, observe so this selection definitely has been done in the puranas also it is mentioned there that's what i want to tell so this uh, whole family is called as cow worms cow worms and uh, so what is the use of this cow milk energy it provides special energy strength and intelligence 
cow dung and urine nourished agriculture and farming and the bullock power helped in development of uh, that is drafting transportation and uh, even now it is used though uh, there is mechanization but still we can see uh, farmers using for transportation in short distances and they are on the smaller bulk of material and um, within the fields if they want to transfer they, they cannot construct a road uh, so they definitely use um, uh, the bullock cart then the skin from the dead animals are used for the leather and uh, leather industry and the handicrafts so uh, there, there are um, evidences to show that all these materials are used since ancient times. So that means the husbandry or the animal husbandry is existing since many, many years. So these are all the evidences what we see in the form of um, in the Indus Valley civilization, all the species of animals. So uh, why they have preferred the cattle, sheep, goat and uh, few uh, so elephants and apex which, which obeyed to the command which uh, which are uh, easily handled by the animals so those animals are definitely seen in as in the form of uh, some uh, uh, drawings or this type of caricatures in uh, different parts or wherever the civilization has started so in, uh, in, in even before that i mean the shastras also uh, they artha shastra they have told they are classifying the animals according to their sex according to the age groups and um, according to the bulls, bullocks which are used for drafting, bulls which are used for uh, breeding. Uh, then uh, the cattle which fits only for the supply of flesh that is also mentioned. So though we are now uh, against uh, slaughtering of the cattle but uh, still, still it has been used as a uh, food animal also some time ago. And buffaloes also are used as a draft. Then uh, the heifers, heifer selection or the selection of the animal uh, female before it becomes pregnant for the first time, uh, that is also a very important aspect mentioned in Artha Shastra. Uh, then another one is the barren animals, which doesn't have any other purpose, which is which, which uh, exhausted of its all age or it has crossed the age of lactation and all those things. Uh, then still they are maintained for the manurial value manual there till it dies of its natural um, uh, thing. So the calves that are one or two months old as, um, as well as those which are still younger. So they have given preference to all age groups. So what we have done in the recent past is as soon as the calf is born, uh, that's a only species, very poor thing for the cattle, the male is born, uh, they say male calf is born with a low tone. If a female calf, a female calf is born, like this time we got a female calf. So that is how the only species where uh, they express. But now how we are going to turn, we cannot avoid this 50-50% uh, or the ratio, natural uh, sex ratio in animals. But now with the recent uh, intervention of this uh, sex sorted semen, you know, we are getting the uh, semen itself sorted out for the female calves. More female calves, so 90% uh, will become female calves and the sex sorting is done using a flow cytometer. I think you have a talk on flow cytometer. That's the instrument which is used to sort the semen uh, because the XX, XY, you know, X, X chromosome uh, is the female. XY is the male. The Y chromosome is very small. The molecular weight of the uh, so sperms carrying the, uh, so either it should be X bearing or Y bearing spermatozoa. So in a haploid uh, uh, sperms, no, the 50% uh, of the semen that is collected will have uh, X-bearing spermatozoa, 50% will be having Y-bearing. If it is not exactly 50%, it should be like that in nature. So the flow cytometer sorts out the X-bearing spermatozoa, which is having higher molecular weight. Because just imagine the X and the Y, which has which is not having one portion so definitely the molecular weight is less the y, y chromosome is a smaller one so the molecular weight is less based on that methodology the x bearing are all separated and that becomes the uh, female in western countries they use the y bearing spermatozoa for uh, the beef production because they want a larger size animal which gives uh, uh, the muscles so they sort the semen for getting uh, beef producing animals why sorted semen and so we are using the sex sorted semen now it has come for almost uh, many breeds it's available um, now officially also we have started using in the breeding program 
so that is where uh, the advancement but whatever it is uh, in the shastras also it is mentioned that you have to have a category of these animals according to their age groups according to their uh, physical structures so if you say globally there are more than 7000 uh, domestic livestock breeds including all the species when i say livestock it includes all the domestic and cattle sheep buffalo uh, and goats hmm? uh, then the regional breeds so different uh, continental breeds different continents have their breeds and uh, there are some 500 transboundary breeds means uh, which are sharing between uh, two countries two regions then uh, international transboundary like uh, china and asia then uh, like that neighboring uh, european and china like that and the border regions because the animal cannot distinguish whether it is andhra or karnataka so there will be a breed which is shared between uh, tamil nadu and karnataka karnataka and andhra kerala and karnataka like that and if you say maharashtra like that adjacent all the border districts uh, will have breeds which are admixture of both the breeds because they don't have, they don't they discriminate only based on the geographical location or availability of the fodder or the preferences of the farmers so naturally they don't have a border that's why there is a trans boundary so this uh, trans um, about the, for the past 50 years 1500 mammalian species have been lost and cannot be replaced so what has happened this uh, lost major major reason uh, can be with the intervention of the human and also some due to natural but uh, the natural is very few um, with because the preference no you go on preferring so if you think of uh, the elephants might have been definitely used in those days for drafting to build a big temple or gopura definitely there were no other instruments except the elephant which can carry such uh, big uh, stones no to from for building a temple so now we are not finding so many number of elephants because we are, we are using other methods so definitely man <laughs> intervention is there uh, like not preferring a particular species so this trans uh, border migration of important breeds due to economic reasons um, and biotic factors like climate change parasitism and lineage so what happens in mass attack of a um, particular disease or full herd has has been disappeared or they get diluted with other breeds other whatever is available it will try to bait within that species so these are all uh, some of the reasons and uh, uh, you know that i think in your um, agronomy courses you would have studied about how the people uh, started the agriculture or they started living in one place before that they were nomadic so along with them the animals also will move whatever animals they want they have moved so even now we can say that for the past 50 60 years uh, we are using european breed salmon is it not hf for the jersey salmon uh, everywhere interior of the village you can see the jersey or the hf it is again a by migration of a breed transboundary breed due to the policy decisions due to the because the government has Uh, introduced that like any other uh, crop or new variety you can see the uh, what is that i frequently come across that happy fruit or the red color fruit which is a uh, uh, dragon fruit so that has come from the desert area now you can see in every part so that is also a migration of a one uh, one new variety which has been introduced and now it will start existing here likewise the animals have also migrated and they have got settled settled in one place now which is original which is duplicate when when we conduct a uh, farmers training when we ask uh, our younger generation may not be knowing hf and jersey is from another country at all because they uh, their parents have also seen as soon as they have born they have seen hf and jersey because it is there for the past 70 years so they when i ask uh, which is uh, mention uh, a native breed they will write hf in mean, our questionnaire because uh, obviously what they are writing is correct because they have not seen the other breeds mm. so this uh, livestock diversity why we need to have this diverse diverse uh, nature definitely it nourishes the soil it nourishes the soil as i said it eats the grass and it excretes the dung which converts uh, it is converted converted into a uh, manure or which enriches the soil i am not going to deep into this 
aspect how how you are going to for what purpose why we are telling uh, we need to conserve the local breeds or the desi breeds whatever the title they have given uh, for me food animal one is for food milk meat and egg uh, so you can see again we are converting them uh, into some of the products uh, which is um, uh, which is edible or which is liked by many people some examples i have given the darwad buffalo pe darwad peda i think you would have you would have tasted that the speciality of the darwad region the peda from the buffalo milk Uh, then the horses and uh, the mules or the donkeys which are used for transport uh, then the companion animals definitely the companion animals have also evolved through uh, evolved through because of the preference of a particular breed for by a uh, human as whichever it guards the uh, farm whichever guards the houses or it just gives psychological comfort then the non food non food products like the wool animal fibers skins bones horns uh, like that uh, so these are the thing and uh, even the smaller species smaller species are kept in the uh, kitchen garden even the poultry or the duck or something every house in kerala you can see they have some ducks uh, uh, because they have ponds so uh, even in uh, some larger uh, uh, establishment they will have the Uh, other species of uh, poultry also uh, they also contribute definitely they eat on the pests insect pests or the uh, harmful uh, ones which are going to harm the roots they peck and eat on that material that is how they create a, a diverse or a balance between the uh, animal and the uh, soil so now let us uh, come to my main topic uh, when we talk of a breed what is uh, called as a breed and i will be elaborating uh, on this aspect in a wholesome way uh, this sub, uh, a breed is a subspecific group of a livestock so if i say cattle cattle has some 500 600 breeds uh, globally which are having definable and identifiable external characters so you should be able to uh, say the just by seeing the horn of that animal and the horn of another animal you should be able they are different breeds which, uh, which you don't need any instrument at all you just visualize and then you are able to tell and uh, they will be able to visually appraise them and the same species which are existing in a geographical or a cultural separation uh, so in my talk i have this first uh, few will be on the geographically how they are separated the next i will tell about how the culturally or the community has participated in evolution of the uh, different breeds of uh, those two aspects way i will cover so they should be phenotypically similar so they should have external features in similar they should have an origin of geographical origin from a separate place and sufficient number should be there then we call them as a breed and we have an agency the national bureau of animal genetic resources uh, in karnal uh, uh, which is the sole authority to register the breeds so every year they uh, the uh, breed number is going on increasing as it gets registered okay now when they started they had now some 30 breeds now there are 53 breeds registered but uh, on the ancient literature says there are more than hundreds of breeds which were existing in india now they are trying to trace back and how they are distinctly different from the other breeds so that is the definition of the breed so this uh, native breeds definitely have a varied coat color and uh, they they have the capacity to adjust to the um, uh, body adjust their body temperature to according to the seasons because uh, we know the extremes up to 45 degrees it goes and then sometimes it comes even lesser than 12 in a particular place so if i say uh, the breeds from rajasthan they have to cope up with both these extremes so that is the speciality of these uh, indian breeds but this uh, may not affect the milk quality the milk quality uh, there are some uh, studies which says uh, the coat color has got uh, some relevance or the fiber length or the hair uh, diameter 
and the milk quantity and the quality there is uh, there is very mild uh, differences not on the chemical composition but only on the uh, the fat and uh, uh, certain proteins which varies otherwise um, nourishment wise it is going to give the uh, same type of nourishment so if you just uh, see which is the point in this one this pointer is not working here so let us see the population trend so i have put the just compared uh, the previous two census that is the 19th and the 20th livestock census uh, what is the status of um, uh, these um, uh, different species this pointer is not working shilpa pointer work aagtilla la kedare ee tara number pointer ille ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ಇದು ಫಾಂಟ್ಸ್ ಹಾಂ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆಯಾ ಹ್ಞೂ ಸರಿ ಓಕೆ ನೀವು ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಶೋಸ್ ದ ಲೈಫ್ ಸ್ಟಾಕ್ ವಿಲ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಕಿಪ್ ದಟ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಯು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸಿ ದಿಸ್ ಒನ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಒನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಟು ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಫೋರ್ ನೈನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಡೌನ್ ಟು ಒನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ನೈನ್ ದ ರೆಡ್ ಒನ್ ಈಸ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಎತ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಸ್ಟಾಕ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಹೆಸ್ ಗಾನ್ ಉಲ್ಟಾ ಸೊ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ ಎ ಸ್ಲೈಟ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ತ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಎತ್ census so this red one is 20th livestock census for those who are sitting at the back uh, you can see the cattle population has increased some 2 million and again this 1.8 million again the sheep population has increased sufficiently uh, that means the preference of this is in the increasing trend preference of sheep is in the increasing trend likewise the goat also Uh, sizable number that is about um, uh, 14 and 10 percent you can see the sheep and goat are uh, on the increasing trend whereas the pig is the decreasing trend so uh, this is the same with other uh, our karnataka also you can try to do this this uh, data is available uh, the population in your state you can just check how uh, the population has changed uh, over the uh, years okay then uh, just if we see the trend Uh, if you go back and see the only i have taken only the cattle as an example here uh, that is 17 18 19 and 20th so this um, see the red one is the indigenous pure native breeds what we are talking of the natural farming system we have to have the native breeds uh, it is in the decreasing trend okay uh, and whereas the total cattle is increasing or the uh, this blue one is the exotic crossbred that is again increasing so that means to say this portion is uh, or this portion is affected by this that is because the indigenous the total population has not changed much okay that this 190 uh, 185 increased and then 199 see in the 2007 it has grown but then it is almost same whereas uh, the indigenous one the red one has decreased and this has increased that means the cross breeds are trying to invade over the presence of the indigenous breeds cross breed population is going on increasing and the pure breed native is going on decreasing so now the challenge uh, is we need we need more of this if we are going to say that i should have uh, the dung or um, urine from a native cow for natural farming system definitely this population should increase or the preference of people keeping this should increase so what and all we have to do because it doesn't actually have any um, cost or expenditure the farmer needn't spend much on maintaining an indigenous breed whereas here he needs to spend spend more on maintaining a cross breed so that is the only pinch point so i used to say to some farmers you have cross breed because you need to have money they need money to sell milk and we also need money living in the cities we need milk no or else milk will reduce very much milk production so uh, you have uh, along with that you have some two three native cows also 
that's how because it is not going to cost on you it's not an expenditure only space you have to provide for them whatever waste you are going to feed is going to feed it's not going to ask any additional concentrates additional investment on feeding see the major any livestock husbandry the major investment or 70 percent of the investment goes on goes to feeding even in our house if you tea, say a yeah, monthly budget majority goes to our food only you all agree i think all of you are family people our budget goes majority not for the other things 70 percent animals also like the 70 percent investment goes for food feeding only so there if the indigenous livestock are going to ask for lesser feed only because it is easily maintained and they are uh, having the natural disease resistant power definitely it is we can convince the farmer to have along with three four crossbred two or three native animals for preparing the jivamrita bijamrita all those things only thing they need a space you need a separate arrangement to collect their dung and urine otherwise they don't ask for anything much so that is how we should see in the uh, 21st life i think the next year they will be doing the census we should see some change uh, in the trend of the indigenous breed because this was in 2019 so another five years once the census are conducted so these are the i said 53 breeds 53 breeds now they are telling that should be hundreds of breeds hundreds or more breeds in our country as per the ancient literatures so just i have put this uh, clumsily uh, to show that the wealth of our nation so we should be really proud of this so let us see how these 53 are classified um, and how we can identify all 53 to remember is definitely an uh, yeah, a big task okay uh, so this uh, how you are going to identify you see uh, like that that is one species i showed the big picture uh, where like that you say for buffaloes there are more than 16 breeds i think 16 17 breeds uh, then for sheep and goats there are more than 60 breeds 60 breeds registered in sheep and goat and then uh, pig also now we are adding uh, she, uh, ducks as well as uh, the geese and uh, the uh, dogs are also added to the list the nbhr has taken the responsibility of registering even the uh, dog breeds uh, huh? yes phone uh, is on the phone okay so you have most productive animals like the mura buffaloes okay and uh, well adapted breeds see these breeds no gir tar parker sahiwal or red sindhi now, as the name indicates, gear is from Gujarat. This Thar Parker, Thar Desert, which can cross the desert. Thar Parker, no? Thar Parker, they can cross the desert, walk in the desert. Imagine we walking in the hot sun, but these cows, they walk in the desert, they feed on the whatever dry, whatever material is there, huh? the cactus or that, and then it gives good quality milk. So, that is the power. Then the Sahi wall. Sahi wall, uh, then Red Sindhi again it is again seen in Pakistan as well as in the Sindh province both. So these are milch breeds which are well adapted. Then you have the most prolific breeds. See the, uh, the goats have the multiple kids, you know, they can give 3, 4, 5. So you have the black Bengal goat, Barbary and beetle which can give more than 2 or 3 kids at a time at a time that is um, uh, which is not seen in other goat breeds of western countries it is very unique to our indian countries then good carpet wool breeds the carpet wool uh, though we don't have we don't uh, need also the fine wool unless we want to uh, uh, give it to other countries get some export and get some uh, money out of it we don't need uh, the fine wool for our type of climate whereas we need a carpet carpet wool to put uh, on the floor during the uh, winter season so we have this uh, magra uh, carpet wool breed and then the uh, highly prolific uh, breed uh, this garol i think um, uh, you all have heard of this uh, nari swarna huh? have you heard of this nari swarna breed a, a breed which is a synthetic breed evolved from this garol which is having a, uh, which was crossed uh, this garol is crossed with a deccani breed Deccani breed of Maharashtra and uh, they have evolved a breed called uh, Nari Swarna, the Nari group, uh, the um, Animal Research Institute of, um, at Pune. 
near Pune. Uh, there, uh, there is a private uh, institution who does research on this where they have done uh, and evolved a new breed called as uh, NARI, that is the initial N-A-R-I is the ex, uh, abbreviation of that institute and uh, they have in evolved a breed called uh, Swarna, Nari Swarna breed of sheep uh, which is uh, having the ability to give twins 25%. 25% of the population you can get uh, twins uh, so one, but in India we have only the garol you know if you just uh, trace this garol this garol sheep has been uh, taken to Australia long long ago uh, for this unique character of uh, twinning so they have crossed uh, with those uh, breeds which were existing in Australia and they were able to get the twinning. So that is how the same persons, Fultan uh, Nariswa people, they were working in that Australian farms and they have come back to India. They have set up their lab and they evolved a new breed, Nariswarna. And uh, I think it was supplied in our Karnataka, I don't know about Andhra and other state. Uh, in Karnataka, they have uh, uh, supplied that to farmers also uh, to get a twin because sheep normally gives only one uh, lamb at a time. So this, uh, so we have some, some, some uh, many other, the list goes on what are the specialities of our native breeds. So these type of uh, extremes are there in our breed which are of uh, beneficial importance. So how we are going to bring back or whether these uh, exotic breeds are going to suppress the native breeds. So let us see how the breeds are classified. See, normal classification we do with uh, with a utility, uh, like based on uh, draft purpose, draft breed, dairy breed, and dual purpose breed. That is the normal uh, classification. Now I am going to give you a different perspective of the classification uh, based on the phenotypic characters, so that we can easily remember them and also guess for what purpose it can be used, whether it can be dual or for the milch purpose and uh, the geographical origin and based on the uh, age groups. So these are the normal uh, methods of classification. So let us see the first group. The first group is called as uh, the lyre horn. Lyre is a bird, a uh, bird in Australia which has a tail which is having uh, a curve like this. The lyre bird's tail uh, has a curve like this, you can see here. So that is lyre horn and they are grey cattle with a wide forehead. Uh, so now you have to, like a beauty pageant, what and all we see you to describe a person as beauty. Now let us describe our cows how they are beautiful by seeing their forehead and uh, the orbital arches. It's not working. Okay, this orbital arches is this that is over the eye. Uh, you can see a fold of skin uh, in gear on uh, many of the native bleeds, the star parker and all. It is just giving a protection. It is doing something. Okay. So this one, this portion, you can see in all these breeds. It is giving a protection to the eyes during the hot seasons, during the when they cross, when they walk in the deserts. And uh, they are um, thin or flat dished face. So this portion, you, uh, you say, uh, if it is having a dish, like uh, a curve like thing, it is a dished face huh? uh, or a flat one like this. So this Kenkata, Kerigar, Kankraj, Tar Parker. Uh, Malvi, all are from the desert regions, desert uh, raj, uh, regions of uh, Rajasthan, uh, which are having uh, the particular character. So that is, you just see the horn, you just see the fo forehead, you just see the presence of the um, uh, these uh, orbital arches. Then you can guess this is from that particular region, huh, which belongs to group one. Then in group two. Uh, just um, you have short horn, white or grey and uh, the shape, you can see this uh, face is uh, here you can see the coffin shape, the shape of a coffin, uh, like a trapezium one side it will be lengthy. So that is called as coffin shape and a convex face you can appreciate in this breed which is having a bulge, uh, Ungol, Haryana, Mewati and Gaulav. Uh, these all come in the group 2 category, group 2 category, okay. Um, 
coffin shaped skull okay. uh, and it is a very big group very big group where majority uh, the krishna valley nagori rathi bachor that is you come down uh, south or the middle part of india uh, you have most of these uh, breeds uh, and uh, this breed krishna valley uh, it's almost uh, it he come to the verge of extinction uh, less than 1000 it is there now uh, some efforts have been put to increase its number because it uh, it resembles the killar breed so people have um, like the uh, doctors or whoever uh, preference for going for killar and they have inseminated krishna valley with the killar 7 so they got diluted so now that is uh, these are so shorter than the killar killer breeds which is used for but this is also a good uh, drafting breed uh, but also has a milk uh, milk uh, so, uh, little quantity of milk so that is how uh, it is um, it has been trying to re re rescue this particular breed then this again uh, this is about from the north we came to the middle part of india now the western part uh, you have the gir and the red siddhi uh, towards the punjab and uh, towards gujarat so these are having heavy dewlap you can see this portion is the dewlap heavy dewlap and the sheath uh, near the the uh, urinary tract you see the sheath and this uh, see the loose skin or the bigger um, skin area it increases the skin area so also the sweat glands a lot of sweat glands or the number of sweat glands over the body surface is increased so that it can overcome the heat and also they may be red in color or white unlike the previous group which was more uh, of gray in color they are having red and red spots also dotted ones also you can see and the horns are a little curled and this it is not there uh, they are called and uh, they are on the lateral unlike in the previous one where the horns were on the top of the forehead now here they are seen on the sides on the sides so that is uh, one difference and that is why we find the forehead to be more bulged uh, in these breeds that is uh, group 3 uh, continued with that uh, the, these are all uh, bilch purpose breeds uh, sahiwal dangi deoni and dimari so you can see the red spots as well as uh, the horns erupting on the sides this must be a aged cow so it is grown lengthy and uh, the sheath also in all these you can see the dewlap as well as the sheath uh, where hanging so which increases the bo uh, body surface area okay. then the group four group four is the one uh, which is uh, amrit mahal hallikar kangayam kilar and uh, this burgur and this burgur alone will have this brown and white spots and in all these they have the shades of gray shades of brown or white uh, shades of white like this so they also have um, the, the they are compact animal with powerful quarters that is they can walk 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 for 18 hours also they can do work and uh, they have a tight sheath unlike the other one and a prominent forehead and the horns em emerge from the pole that is almost uh, uh, you can see here the this portion is called as the pole on the skull so from that the horns erupt very closely the horns erupt so these are the, the different characters of the group four okay and most of them are very good draft animals and uh, these um, the next one is the group five so i think now you are able to recollect group one two three the major difference huh? uh, the group five which is a mixed type it will have all colors they are also used for minimum drafting they are also used for milk both dual purpose and they have a hump and a slightly lyre shaped horn or uh, stump like horn unlike the previous one which has a long horns they have a stump like horns and uh, some will have hairs more hairs also in the hilly tract we can see that in this uh, lakimi uh, badri and malnad uh, the hairy breeds also hairy were variants in that also uh, and also all mixture admixture of different colors and they are short stature that is group five and the group six is the dhani breed uh, which are very huge breeds uh, which is seen in the india pakistan border uh, they uh, they are more in the uh, Pakistan side 
but they are also seen uh, they are called as the transboundary breeds uh, which is having very in varied colors here again it is having varied color but a very large huge breed so that is the the dunny breed this also we see in india okay so there are six uh, breeds so why why these uh, breeds uh, are so this is about the breed but we don't find uh, the sufficient number of these breeds whatever uh, five groups uh, leave the six uh, the five groups uh, sufficient number in pure form so in pure form they are not found one reason because in 1960 to 70 they started the artificial insemination that was the time when uh, the intensive cattle development program or different uh, policies have come dictated by the government of india to increase the milk production so before that up to 1960 65 or before the um, the white revolution uh, we were uh, importing milk powder so now the uh, our uh, policy makers thought we should make uh, a self sufficient country for the milk now we are topping in the milk production Uh, that's how the cross breeding program came but at that point of time there was no thought process to safeguard that breed they had the only uh, uh, motto to increase milk production so many of them which were not uh, having pure breed character or which may be pure breed were inseminated with a exotic semens or a cross bred semen so that the, the milk production can be increased so that is how gradually we could see that the milk production increased drastically but that point of time we lost many of the pure breeds now the thought has come in the recent uh, breeding policy what they have told now the breeding tract is demarcated which are the native uh, breeds i will show in my future slides uh, how to identify where the breeding tract of a particular breed is this i think you are all from different uh, parts of the country then you can uh, i guess at least what is there in my place of work at least that we should say the farmers encourage the farmers to safeguard that breed if everyone as an agriculture or animal husbandry scientist if you are going to have that responsibility definitely we can resurrect all the breeds because now the breed semen is available all those 53 breed semen is available once we know this region is native of a particular breed you make the farmers to motivate the farmers to have that pure breed only another 20 30 years we may have all in in the breeding tag the pure form of that particular breed which we have lost we can definitely resurrect so that is there with the hands of the grassroot level like you may be in a uh, university but you will be training your agriculture uh, Uh, officers uh, from your region so through them we can reach likewise the veterinarians we have doctors we train them who are working in the field we, because they are the one who are going to do the insemination there so in your district you have so that is in the breeding policy what they have to wherever the breeding tract of a particular pure breed is there the uh, the persons have to use that they have given a target if it is uh, like killer breeding tract they will supply more killer and you have to document them and give how many killer semen you have inseminated so like that in one year they will have more killer calves then in the next year again the daughters born uh, in two three years again if they are going to give a killer semen definitely in the third generation we will have another 20 25 years we will have all the pure breeds resurrected uh, that is only in the hands of us okay so what are what are the reasons i am not shall i explain this uh, so why why this uh, the breeds have reduced is because of the uh, loss of natural resources where the grazing method practice has changed to intensive uh, method of rearing and the agricultural um, activity has expanded so they they and uh, monocropping where uh, if it is a pa paddy in those days they should, they might have paddy or leguminous crop and all those things alternating now they are putting only paddy after after paddy i know in my grandmother's place they used to put um, these um, uh what is black gram after paddy they put uh, black gram after harvesting they will put bende then again only uh, the next season only the paddy will come so but now it is not uh, done so maybe again it is again the policy dictated whatever that we are doing uh, 
uh, that's the thing. Then the mechanization, the dependency of the animals for transport has sizably reduced. So that is one reason where we have lost many of the preferences have gone or the sh animal shed available has been occupied by the crossbred animals. So there is no space for them to keep. So they reduce the number. There is no need for a draft animal. There is no uh, bullock cart at all in their house. Then why they need? They may use a tractor or some other mode of transportation, lorry or a truck. So that is the reason where it is. Then again the policy. Whatever policy is dictated as a government servant, we do according to whatever. Is. Because the targets are fixed for the agriculture officer or a veterinary officer. This much you have to do, this much semen you have to do, they would do that. Now that time, even when I started my practice in 1984, we used to catch hold of all the native breeds and castrate. In health camps, only castration camp was there. Castration camp itself was a major thing. And if one crossbred calf is born, that will be appreciated and those doctors will be rewarded, the farmer will be rewarded because he maintains a crossbred calf. Now we have to start rewarding them for having a pure breed of native cow. That is the uh, reverse. So every everything, no, the, like the fashion also goes and again we change to the older fashion. Like that, uh, this also changes. Okay. Every 30 years, some change has to happen. So in this, um, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, seen this. That is Global Livestock Production System. This is one of the picture I like because uh, it classifies the whole country uh, according to the livestock production system. Um, yes. So that is livestock only, only livestock is kept or only mixed is kept, crop, only crop is kept or only grassland is there, only landless are there, rain fed are there, only irrigated are there. So like the different, you can see this um, uh, whole country, uh, it is an admixture. You can't say one state is having one particular livestock production system. That's what I wanted to show. Uh, there is no uh, distinction. Every state, every state in our country, you can see yellow, violet, purple, green, all the dots on the uh, whole of the country. That means to say all types of production system are existing in immaterial of a particular state and uh, only uh, in this um, medium to... Uh, this MGH, no, mixed crop, is seen in the Gangetic play. Rest all are almost similar. Then, this is one of the picture to say uh, how the land uh, use is covered. So when we talk of livestock, we need permanent pastures or the grazing land, which is only 3.2%. And the agricultural land covers 55.3%. So now we have to calculate how much uh, agricultural byproducts are obtained by that 55.3 percent of land as a fodder in the form of fodder and how much pasture we are able to get fodder for the animals all 365 days. So if we think of increasing the number of livestock we should definitely cushion them with the fodder availability. So what, what methods we can do uh, to conserve the agricultural waste when it is converted into a uh, feed for the animals. How we are going to do? That should be the thought process here. And again, definitely the ecological zones. So ecological zones, how uh, this I will show in another picture, the elevation. So the uh, how, uh, how much height it is there, uh, how much elevated. So when you go uphill, you can have only smaller species. Uh, larger species live in the lands, plains. So then how you are going to encourage uh, people working in the upland to uh, go for sheep or goat or uh, uh, breeds like Malnad Gita or a short stretched breeds, which can climb up the hill. Uh, then the rainfall, definitely the rainfall uh, is an important aspect which is going to help us in our natural farming system. So if this year the total failure in monsoon in Karnataka. So we are going to definitely face a, a, a fodder deficiency because maize cultivation has totally, uh, I think your agriculture scientist will be doing because we are seeing while traveling across no maize is cultivated because there were no rains. Post monsoon rains were not at all there. Hmm? Uh, 
and the agroclimatic divisions uh, so yeah, like uh, how you have the arid semi arid humid sub humid highland now i will explain what are all the breeds found in these uh, different agricultural zones so that we can whoever is working in that particular area can concentrate on uh, the purity of those particular uh, breeds then conditions favorable why i have put this condition favorable for crops is very important for an animal husbandry person because once the harvest happens we get paddy straw we get ragi straw maize everything is totally interdependent again the store of the compost and everything it is going to turn to the soil uh, once the next crop they are going to start are preparing the land so definitely the conditions uh, favorable for the crops is very important and the physiogeographic position mountainous uh, whether it is in a river bank like the indo gangetic plain peninsular so in karnataka if you say major part is uh, deccan plateau and uh, coastal coastal plains and uh, one third growing season so there will be some uh, locality where uh, they will they will be totally depending on the animal because the only one season they will grow or they may have the crop the rest all their earnings will be from the animal husbandry like uh, a region uh, around bangalore and all you can see like that one season they grow one season kolar and all towards the border of uh, andhra pradesh they use uh, they depend on only one season crop and the next season they depend on animal husbandry sheep or the cross bred uh, animals then non agricultural land so there are, there are definitely non agricultural land how best we can convert these uh, non agricultural land to some other purpose so i will explain about that mm. Mm. so based on so the different uh, people have uh, done a classification uh, based on soil characteristics uh, climate vegetation topography 16 groups are there and bioclimatic features rainfall temperature altitude and vegetation there are five groups then length of uh, growing period cultivation of annual crops whether it is a 90 day crop 60 day crop like that they have classified five groups so as per the planning commission there are 15 uh, uh, groups agroclimatic i think we follow this i think you all follow this fifth planning commission whatever has told then under narp 127 agroclimatic groups are there so uh, so based on that whatever crops whatever seed whatever fertilizer it will be supplied to that particular region then accordingly we get the feed and fodder for the animals so again at that season if it is a short crop 60 days 90 days crop whether the by products after harvesting the legumes how best we are going because the legume uh, leaves and the see whatever leaf which is broader and which gives a beans like uh, uh, anything uh, like cluster beans or any thing a legume uh, their pods their seed coat their uh, leaves stems everything is a fodder which is rich in protein which may have from at the level of 18% so if you feed to a native animal you need not give concentrate at all Uh, but uh, how we are going to uh, harvest them because now we are seeing finding the mechanization uh, one day it is helping the farmer because his dependency on the labor is reduced but now they are using harvester or some methods uh, which helps uh, which doesn't allow them to collect the uh, materials for feeding the animals so what best we can do every crop which is harvested mechanized in using mechanized uh, processes what are all the waste they are generating how best we can use them as an animal feed and uh, we get some of the farmers um, sending us samples uh, from uh, different materials they get from, from their agriculture and testing it for different uh, uh, nutrient levels in our nutrition lab so these uh, these things has to be thought of uh, you may think after harvesting the legumes uh, you don't need them but definitely they are needed as a fodder how we are going to uh, store them or preserve them or keep them or encourage the farmers to maintain them as a fodder to their animals then the agro ecological uh, zones national bureau of soil survey says there are uh, 20 20 different uh, agro ecological uh, regions so now when we say when i just superimposed i took the different uh, regions 
coming under uh, the see if i say highland highland which is the region marked on the map in that in that region what are the breeds available what are the species available like that i classified and i was able to get uh, see the humid subtropical and uh, tropical wet and dry these are the two regions where you have more concentration of livestock husbandry or the cattle sheep or the goat um, the tall ones the blue one uh, in this this blue is the uh, cattle and the red one is buffalo uh, so in these two you can see humid subtropical and the graphs are taller the rest regions are all uh, smaller uh, where the population is less and the density is less whereas it is more in these two regions so we have to concentrate on the breeds in these two regions so that more number of breeds are there in those regions then most indigenous uh, breeds if you say most indigenous breeds again they are the distributed in the this humid subtropical tropical wet and uh, semi arid regions so these uh, regions are uh, well adapted by these particular uh, breeds that is number of breeds available in a particular region the, the names of the breeds uh, belonging to a particular region were counted and uh, it has been imposed on this graph hmm. so major are uh, distributed in tropical wet dry region and semi arid region which is in high and very high vulnerable zone so if we see these two zones they have done another one uh, for a climate uh, change studies which are all the regions which are vulnerable for the climate change we found which are the regions uh, where the more cattle and livestock are there those are the regions falling under the vulnerable region so definitely there is going to be some clash between the change of the climate and the, uh, the pre existence of the present uh, animal population and how we are going to safeguard those animals that is the question in front of us so the challenges what we face is the zones whatever i have shown so many people have classified different zones and how we are going to concise those zones and concentrate on a particular crop variety for suitable for a particular zone and calculate the number of cattle and the feed and fodder requirement for them so how much in each zone we should have the pasture land classified uh, yeah, availability of the agro by products as feed and fodder has to be classified and what are the number of pure breeds existing so these things has to be thought of then uh, you see the small fragmented land is also one of the uh, reason where we you cannot impose the farmer having fragmented land to reserve some space for the fodder production so how best we are going to convert the common uh, grazing lands as a community grazing land or community pasture production facility like that then the dependency the they, all these are again dependent on the monsoonal rains and again the regions which are prone to natural ca calamities either flood drought or the uh, which earthquake is totally unpredictable but the flood uh, at least we can forecast uh, and safeguard the animals and uh, drought also we can definitely forecast and uh, we can conserve the feed or the water or use other methods to conserve whenever the rain is there or whenever the rains are available and store the water or using uh, micro irrigation techniques to conserve the water so these are the things where but earthquake we cannot uh, it is totally unpredictable okay so in 2016 uh, they have uh, published one study if anybody interested you can uh, read that it will help you to uh, do some projects on those pro on that uh, that is india's 572 rural districts they have covered in that and they have surveyed and they have classified the vulnerable uh, regions and uh, in that the what are the criteria they have used three major criteria uh, for ca classifying them as vulnerable uh, lands sensitivity uh, the exposure and then adaptive capacity in that sensitivity degraded land annual rainfall vulnerability to cyclone or drought so they will just take the each and every village and the this district they have classified them according to that exposure maximum and minimum temperature heat wave and cold wave in that particular 20 years of period how many times heat wave and cold wave have affected in that region 
and the uh, actual survey is done in that adaptive capacity. How many agriculturists or their literacy, their gender gap, electrification, and all those things. This uh, survey based on this, they have classified the vulnerable uh, zones. So they, and uh, they, this is being again mapped. Whatever the results they obtain has been uh, mapped. Shall I continue? You have something to discuss? So now to, uh, for whatever we say, I think these are all uh, maybe a repetition uh, from some other things. Um, uh, yeah, natural resource management on the crop, improving crop production, improving livestock and fisheries production and intervention by way of re uh, research. E these four points are very much essential if we want to have a resilient, resilient agriculture where it can cope up with any type of climate adversities. So why we have to discuss this? Because we need the agro byproducts as an animal feed and fodder, totally dependent on that. And um, uh, how we can uh, overcome this or how we can, these four things, improving cropland management, uh, then pasture and grazing, grazing land management. So how much, what are the type of um, crops you can prefer when you want to have a, a grazing land? Then restoration of degraded lands. So this is also in, in a natural farming system, this uh, restoration of the degraded lands plays a very major role because sometime it must have been an agricultural land which has got degraded maybe due to over exploitation. Over exploitation or use of some other chemicals uh, to maximum extent where so how, what is the deficiency in that soil or how uh, whether there is any leaching of the water soluble minerals so how you are going to cope up with those uh, then management of the organ organic soil so these four aspects are very much important when we want to um, for all these you need the animal manure also then the alternative crops uh, like uh, we can diversify following a rotation cropping system or uh, using horticulture or horti pasture, having uh, the fruit, vegetables like the mango with the grazing. We attempted in some farms near Bangalore uh, where one, uh, he was some director of agriculture, I think he bought some land in North Indian, settled in Bangalore. He has uh, vast land. So what we did in his farm, uh, uh, mango, full of mango garden, uh, we partitioned the whole um, uh, mango uh, garden into uh, with fencing and uh, we cultivated, uh, we, we did a practical experiment in his farm because he was so cooperative because he was already a uh, retired director of uh, uh, I think uh, ICR. Uh, then we, uh, we partitioned the whole mango garden into small fencing. Inside that we grew different varieties of leguminous and uh, perennial uh, fodder grasses. Then uh, the uh, sheep were let in inside the mango garden to feed, to graze, uh, graze on that partition as a rotation grazing system and definitely it worked. So earlier he used to get only revenue during the mango season uh, and now uh, he was getting more by uh, having a sheep husbandry also. And it is uh, like the sheep uh, goes with the dry uh, condition also. Since we enriched with uh, fodder varieties, uh, they grew faster. So that was one of the practical model uh, which can be propagated and uh, it, uh, it was also relished by many. Like it was, uh, it attracted many visitors also to his farm. Then uh, he expanded uh, some of the fringes of the mango garden uh, to uh, horticulture like the roses and uh, other plants which uh, uh, like for making bouquets and all. In Bangalore it is a demanding uh, thing and uh, some more like tuberose because his son was into uh, yeah, some industry who makes these perfumes so tuberose also he grew in in one portion there was a pond and a wet facility was there so there he grew to tuberose so like that where multiple cropping multiple um, uh, including the livestock system uh, he was able to get which was just a barren uh, mango tree uh, I so these are uh, like the, the government agencies which is uh, promoting, I will not tell different uh, 
policy decisions like the National Mission on Sustainable Agri Agriculture, National Initiative on Climate, Food Security Mission, Mission for Integrated Development of Horticulture, Mission on Agriculture. Why I put this is you can just check these websites if there is any call for some projects because most of you are assistant professors. You can try to apply uh, in under this mission to get some projects funded. Huh? Uh, with the concept of livestock husbandry, you have that component, definitely you will be succeeding in getting that. So now we need towards better soil health, towards higher water use efficiency. So this portion I'm not going to read. I think you are all well versed. Towards better managing climate change and towards healthy livestock. Ultimately, the healthy livestock here, uh, we should concentrate on um, uh, disease control by vaccination. Uh, routine vaccination or uh, that is one of the major aspect and the preference of the particular breed. So that is what we call it as a climate smart livestock rearing, utilizing natural adaptability. This is one of the major principle. You should have native breeds in your natural farming system and native breeds which are naturally adapted to that particular uh, region. Uh, adaptive traits which is having a trait which is adaptable, indigenous breeds with production potential, then breeding management where preference of the breed for that particular uh, breed in that region for the production method and disease management. So these uh, five, six principles, uh, if we adopt uh, for the native breed, uh, we can definitely. I'll stop with this. We'll continue. We'll continue after tea break because I need to explain this. Asked me to quickly finish. Uh, so one small uh, whatever uh, research uh, we have done uh, in your natural farming or zero budget farming research, no? we coordinated with uh, your scientist here. Uh, so this is um, the, let others join, it's a small presentation. I uh, will continue with the rest later. Uh, so this small statured breed, you know, this Malnad Gidda breed, uh, is a small statured breed native of uh, Western Ghats and it is uh, uh, found in seven districts of Karnataka. And uh, unlike the other breeds like the Halikar, Amrit Mahal, uh, which are shared uh, uh, adjacent uh, state also, you can see the Halikar in Tamil Nadu also, like that Kilar is seen in both Karnataka and the Devani is seen in Karnataka and Maharashtra. Kilar also is seen in Karnataka Maharashtra. But this uh, particular breed is um, uh, purely a native of um, Karnataka and it is seen in the Western Ghats, districts of Western Ghats, seven districts. And um, you can see this uh, is the star short statured breed. Uh, which is concentrated only in the Western Ghat region and uh, it comes in uh, different colors and majority are black in color. And uh, this breed is particularly uh, breed number 37 registered and it is um, used main for its manual value and also for the milk and uh, uh, drafting also they use. Uh, in the hill slopes where the um, they follow some step cultivation or like that uh, where the paddy fields are very small no it is of small stature so they can go and turn for used for puddling and all those things plowing and puddling uh, and um, uh, so that is how it is having all the three purpose uh, of so these are the different color variants uh, we see in our, our college farm and uh, this is how the breeding tract, just uh, some 50, 60 kilometers uh, you go away from this city, you can find these type of uh, dense uh, evergreen forest. Uh, earlier they used to take these animals to graze in the forest. Now uh, with the restriction in the grazing, uh, they are not allowing and it is all fenced. So they are allowed to graze only on the roadsides. And uh, the rest all they have conver converted to areca cultivation or commercial crops. So that is one of the reason where the uh, large herds which were existing in each house, they will have uncountable number of animals. Now it has reduced to 50, 20, 15 to 20 animals. Uh, that is how uh, the thing, the breeding tract. And uh, these are the, like now see they are there because of that restricted grazing land, they just walk on the roadsides and they feed or whatever and this is our college farm. Uh, 
uh, where here also we have a semi-intensive system of management uh, where we don't tie the animal only in the evening uh, they will be kept in the enclosures and uh, this is one of the method which I want to explain here uh, which is called a sopina kotige in uh, Kannada. Uh, so what they do is every day uh, like this one uh, enclosure will be there uh, the it, their floor, flooring will be spread with the tree leaves um, especially jackfruit leaves measure will be at jackfruit leaves or any other leaves it will be spread so as a bedding material for the animals once they come back from grazing the animals are let loose inside the shed so they come from grazing from 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock they will remain there all the calves and the unproductive animals everything one or two animals they will milk and the rest all they will allow the cow to, uh, calf to suckle the cow they won't milk whatever is needed for their house that much milk they will collect and uh, next uh, the overnight the whatever dung and urine voided by the animal will be uh, there in the uh, on the bedding material only then the next day when the animal goes for grazing again they put over that another layer of leaves so like that for almost 15 days they will put layer after layer then after 15th day they will collect the whole material and put it in a pit uh, in a pit for composting so what happens here because it is having uh, the more of uh, monsoonal rains for nearly eight months it will be having rains uh, they cannot uh, uh, make the compost heap like thing so they make uh, this opina kotige method so after uh, layer of after 45 50 days or 90 days uh, they will take the um, full composted uh, material or allow it like that only till complete composting happens and then it will be turned to the soil especially areca coffee or any commercial crops uh, then here they have uh, cardamom also pepper also cardamom pepper uh, areca and coffee the majority of the farmer then cocoa cocoa also they have so they these uh, because all these crops uh, require organic uh, material so that is uh, this uh, by this method this opina kotege method they are able to increase the bulk of the manure so which um, uh, you can attempt that and i think uh, they have so this is some of the pictures of that and how they are used for uh, plowing also in the small fields uh, on the way to joga i think if they may take you to some other university campus visit uh, you can see that uh, these small fields hmm? so this is our um, whatever facility they have given we are maintaining them uh, both in the night we feed uh, dry roughage and in the day they go for grazing after grazing they come at 3 30 4 o'clock uh, then uh, after milking we put some uh, chaffed green fodder then on the night it is fed with and one uh, only milking animal we give some 250 grams of concentrate uh, that's all and the milking capacity is also less on a whole day it may give uh, two two and a half liters of milk including that is fed to the calf uh, so the manure whatever we collected exclusively I will not get the manure in the compost form uh, they have collected and they uh, we have given to agriculture university for research and I think Dr. Shilpa will elaborate on the nutrient content and then the comparative study of Malnad Gidda, other exotic as well as the uh, whatever regular organic manure you are using. Uh, she has done a research on different crops. I think I have told because I we have not done any research on that angle. But uh, that's Opena Kotege and this I wanted to tell you how uh, it is used and of course vermicompost also we make and directly sell it to the farmers because there is a demand for the vermicompost from the uh, Malnad Gidda animals. And uh, since this farm is separate from the other dairy farm, uh, we are able to store the native animals uh, manure. So what um, you can tell to the farmers is that the exotics uh, dung can be stored as separately and if they are having both uh, exotic and the individual uh, native animals indigenous animals let them uh, store these uh, as a separate uh, uh, manurial material so that uh, it will help you help the farmer for adopting the natural um, uh, graze natural farming system and uh, and also the chaffing the fodder is very much important uh, because it helps in conservation feed uh, fodder conservation if you are giving a lengthy fodder and also uh, even overgrown napier grass also if it is chaffed and fed the animal prefer to eat rather than giving it as a full lengthy one where it goes as a waste 
I, once it is trampled by the dung or soiled by the dung and urine, the animal will not eat. But still it can be turned into the manure pit. But still because we are having uh, for a shortage of fodder, we have to advise the farmer to how best they can uh, utilize the available fodder. Uh, and uh, this is about the average milk yield is only 1.2 kgs. Uh, and then we made one more attempt. This is one of my project also, which grew into a bigger project in uh, Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yojane, where we did a small um, facility to grow fodder, organic, completely organic uh, fodder, where no chemicals were used, and um, there are different uh, fodder varieties, both leguminous and uh, perennial grasses, and then trees, uh, uh, sesbenia and, uh, and drumstick. Uh, trees. So, in a small plot, uh, we could grow like less than uh, a quarter acre. Uh, we could grow this, and it was self sufficient for 10 Malan Gidda animals. So, now what the same model uh, we are uh, pro proposed for the uh, Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yojana as a rotation grazing system where we are com creating three compartments compartmentalized grazing. Uh, so, one after another, we can uh, grow the uh, fodder and the leguminous fodder along with the perennial uh, trees. So, we can uh, use this uh, uh, like a degraded land uh, can be converted into a fodder producing uh, resource. And um, since we have not used from the beginning only, we have not used any chemical fertilizer to grow this uh, fodder. So, uh, definitely that was also a waste land. So, you can definitely encourage the farmers to grow such uh, fodders uh, so that organically they can have an organic milk or something testing and claim that it is an organic farm like that. So, this is the some shed on uh, the fodder trees we have grown and the calves, most of the calves now we have during the uh, this corona uh, we gave many of the calves and cows. Uh, to the farmers to whom we have trained and uh, they are all there. They are all using uh, for making Bejamrita, Jeevamrita and up to Mysore uh, people have taken our animals, Ramnagra, Mysore, near Bangalore also, uh, they have taken the animals and, and now we are having uh, only 12 animals and also in that process we motivated the farmers to have uh, different, um, uh, we did a practical demonstration of uh, preparation of these uh, milk products uh, from the Malnad Gidda alone, so that uh, the taste differs and uh, pre preference. So in that way we can uh, conserve the fodder, the, the breed, particular breed, uh, because it is, uh, it can be uh, sustained in this particular region with less investment. And one of the Malnadgeta Breeders uh, Association, which we created from, the, uh, they grew into you know, FPO, Farmers Producers Organization, and they have registered and they are also going to get a government support for that. Some uh, 300 people are members of that FPO. Uh, they are uh, doing Bijamrita, Jeevamrita, Gana Jeevamrita also from this Malnadgeta. Whatever they have, five or six animals, they you do it as a community uh, product. And also, uh, they they tried this uh, um, uh, whey butter, whey, uh, whey candy. So, this whey candy, whey is obtained after the getting the paneer. Uh, so, I leave the slides with here. You can just see the procedure of making paneer and uh, that kulfi. Uh, from the, I believe it is, uh, it is self-explanatory. I leave the PPT for you to follow. Uh, you can take those and you can try and motivate the farmers and they tried during some festival season and uh, there was a lot of preference for the kulfi and the way paneer paneer they made different um, dishes also. So now we are able to reach uh, the interior villages also through that association and way candy that way whatever uh, material liquid after getting the paneer uh, the liquid of the milk um, water watery portion. Uh, that has uh, we converted into whey candy, like an ice cream uh, stick. Uh, so they, that also they were able to market and now uh, they are thinking that association of keeping an ice cream shop also in that. So they are, the disadvantage, um, why they, they, are not a, they are not able to sell it to the milk society? Because that is priced less 
for them. So when they convert, pool the milk, because two to two and a half liters means in one house, if they have some three, four cows, they may get four, five liters milk only for after their consumption, they may be able to sell. So instead of putting it to the K milk, milk society, uh, they are pooling the milk and converting them into ice cream and milk products, butter, ghee and all those things, which fetches more revenue for them. Uh, so that is what, uh, so where a herd can be kept, a herd of Malnad Gidda can be kept, which can be converted into milk products. So likewise, any other native breeds also will give the same quantity of milk. So for that purpose, we can encourage farmers to have five, six animals. Uh, the dung can be converted into the different methods of manure and it can be sold. Again, the milk can be converted into different milk products. And always it should have a breeding uh, bull also in the herd. That is one, uh, every two years the bulls have to be changed. Uh, so this is one of the success thing which uh, we could get. Uh, some three training programs we did for milk products. And again uh, on the same training program we had the dung and urine, Vijamrita, Jeevamrita, Gana Jeevamrita and uh, so many other things uh, Dr. Shilpa demonstrated uh, which um, uh, it has reached the farmers. So they are trying to at least use for their own and also to sell to the neighboring farmers, though not in a large scale. So now the FPO, they are thinking of marketing and reach to, and along with that, uh, they are making uh, other uh, products from the dung, uh, like the dhoop sticks, uh, deepa, and um, so many other uh, dung powder, and coloring uh, material for rangoli, uh, like that they are going on doing in their own creative uh, methods uh, and uh, they are trying to market and encash it out of that. So, and uh, these things uh, we did in our farm as a demonstration and also for the marketing, there is a demand for this panchakavya also. Panchakavya and uh, this, uh, they ask dry cow dung cake uh, from a pure native cow. So that also uh, we were able to uh, do that and similar way which uh, we can say that the dairy farmers, we have to change their uh, thought process where uh, crossbred gives milk, uh, gives 10 liters or 15 liters of milk, but you get, uh, you don't go for other um, products where you can do in this type of indigenous uh, breeds. So this uh, one model uh, we I gave and it, it worked for some farmers, three cow, three calvings so that all through the year they will have three lactating cows, at least five to six liters of milk. If one or two liters they are using for their household consumption, the four liters can be converted into different uh, products um, by either butter, ghee or ice cream, kulfi and uh, whey, uh, whey, whey and paneer. So the, where uh, five, six houses together can join and convert them into paneer and uh, mutually sell, uh, sell in the nearest town. So that's the thing. Okay. See why this uh, natural adaptation is very important, like the Malnad Gidda is adapted to the uh, hilly tract, this uh, physical nature of the, of the skin tissues or the skin hair coat or the size length of the hair, uh, all those things and the body surface area uh, like in the gear or uh, which is having a uh, hanging uh, dewlap and other things. Uh, and uh, so you see, you cannot think of having uh, the Malnad Gidda and taking it to Gujarat or many people bring uh, gear and keep it here, but it is not advisable. What It is going to give the same quantity of milk. So what we have to say, these, uh, those breed which is native of your place is adapted to the climatic condition because of all this, the color, body surface, water, sweat production, nature of the hair, everything is a natural adaptability. So you should say that all are indigenous breed, whatever you have as an Hallikar or Amrit Mahal is also a native of your place, which is also going to give the same precious uh, dung or manure what you get from gear or other animals. So people think that only gear is the desi breed. The others are all not desi breeds. 
only HF1 jersey or the temperate breeds, the rest are all tropical breeds, whatever we have. So first if you are from Andhra, you say Ongol, Ongol breed. Ongol breed also gives same quantity of milk like the Malnad Gita, but it is having the hair coat and the sweat glands more suited for its cli the climate what you have in uh, Andhra or Telangana. When, uh, when you say the Gujarat as a coastal type of climate which is also having a peninsular type of climate but it is also having a desert type of climate during the winter season. We have a very cold winter and very hot uh, day time. So day and night differs in the north northwestern part like the Rajasthan or Gujarat whereas it doesn't much vary between day and night in the peninsular India. So the, accordingly the animals are adapted which are inherited, which we do, we cannot change. And now after bringing gear, they are telling they are not conceiving, they are not giving birth to calf. There is, because they are not adaptable to this climate and they are huge in size, where it is not possible to uh, uh, go with the humid, most uh, part of the year will be very highly humid in this Shumoga district and Western Ghats. The rainfall is, if the rainfall is less also, you sweat like anything. That is the thing. So adaptive traits um, developed in livestock over a period of time. It is not developed on one go. So whether uh, the, the, you can see that obviously the seasonality of the lambing. So November, December and uh, the summer lambing and uh, winter lambing we see in case of sheep. So again, uh, the summer, lamb, uh, summer lambing will be more than the winter uh, lambing. Why? Because the summer, after summer the monsoon comes, uh, it becomes a flush season where more fodder is available, then more lambing happens. So well, what we can advise, we can advise the sheep flock to go for synchronization, synchronization and see that more animals comes to heat during the summer season, then you will have the lambing. Accordingly, you can plan. Uh, and then uh, this uh, high fiber feeds, you no know, surplus fiber in the form of uh, fat. So whenever there is, uh, you can see dry fodder is fed, more quantity of dry fodder is fed, uh, the milk will have higher fat percentage. Whenever uh, that is the difference. When uh, what happens in this Moga district, or in particular season, they get plenty of uh, grasses. What they do, will feed plenty of green grasses. Animal also will not relish. So we used to advise them to mix uh, the dry roughage and green roughage and feed. That is also, then what happens if they feed more of uh, uh, green roughage, the water, milk becomes watery and it will be rejected in the milk society because it is having uh, low SNF content, low solids not fat content. So you both, more dry roughage is required. So again, uh, more dry roughage is required means you should have the cropping properly, then only they will get the dry roughage. If maize or um, ragi or paddy straw is not available, what alternative they can use? So here they tried one alternative is um, uh, areca sheet, areca leaf, areca leaf shredded or areca leaf sheet. So here adaptability of this is minimum loss of body condition at high temperature. So what happens here, even if there is a day and night, very few days you can see a change. In a one day itself, there will be a fluctuation of temperature. These breeds are naturally adapted even there is a fluctuation of temperature and they are disease resistant. Even you can see when there is an outbreak of a disease, uh, these um, uh, animals are uh, recover faster. These, um, even Malnad Gidda, we got foot and mouth disease or some disease which was spreading in the, this area at that point of time, they all recovered very fast compared to them and uh, mostly we advise uh, these neem leaf, feeding of neem leaves to indigenous uh, breeds, uh, you can definitely encourage which increases uh, the immunity also, they relish, unlike the crossbreds don't feed on the neem leaves, the indigenous breeds feed on the neem leaves, even if it is... Um, uh, then uh, these traits are polygenic in inheritance, so we can um, exploit that polygenic inheritance only by using multiple different type feeding different types of fodder varieties like leguminous, non-leguminous, both dry and uh, green roughage. Admixture of this uh, should be fed. 
uh, when you have sufficient leguminous fodder in your natural farming system, you can say there is no need for feeding concentrates at all because the, that itself contains 18 percent. If they are getting 5 to 6 kg of uh, leguminous fodder in the green form or 2 to 3 kg in the dry form like your groundnut or something which is dried and fed. Uh, the leaves, the whole plant is dried and fed to the animals. It's not, those are all rich in um, uh, proteins. So where they do, don't need to feed concentrates at all. So they survive with <coughs> roughage only. And they are able to convert that roughage into fat and have them as a body store, which help them uh, in the, its adaptability. And uh, these are the different breeds. I will leave this uh, picture, uh, the slides are there. You can. Uh, copy, I think your sir will be giving this, uh, different regions where, uh, uh, what are the breeds available. So accordingly, whichever state or whichever region you belong, you can encourage the farmers to have these indigenous uh, breeds. Uh, not only, you should discourage all of them to go for gear breeds. The only uh, uh, benefit they get is from the gear, the middleman gets more money. That's what is happening. Uh, people blindly go and I directly I called the middleman also. Uh, th that is our survival, that's what they say. Uh, they just uh, charge uh, some 80, 90,000. And I inquired with our colleagues in Gujarat also. They said they never sell the good ones. Whatever is not wanted, whatever is not true to their breed, whichever is giving less milk, like that, those only goes to other state. And our people thinking that gear is only the desi breed and they buy and the farmers uh, lose that. And, uh, and it is having um, problem, uh, difficulty in consumption. Then after one lactation, they immediately sell to another person and they also make some money. And uh, afterwards, it will go to the slaughter only. That's what I believe. So better to encourage the farmers native of whatever breed is native of their own region. I will, uh, I will, I'll skip all this. Uh, one, this is the joke for us, but unfortunately, you know, any differences. Uh, the horn pattern, the skin coat, everything is the same, but within that, the color, uh, white, pure white dots and uh, black face, like that. And also in, Thank you. 
they have amongst their tribes. The female uh, animals should not be so go out of our term. That's what uh, the term was saying. The gear. They won't sell the good producing gear. Whatever gear is seen everywhere here and there are the best product So what we can do? Then the, the species selection is very important. So this is one uh, in Russia local mission also. They, uh, they have now policies there to safeguard the indigenous fleet of that particular region. When you are from the uh, uh, project, you see that this is the breed name also. Safeguard that breed I am proposing this. So it is under natural farming system. We can reduce this uh, and upgrade all the northeast. So in that we can have a criteria also upgrading all the native which are not described in that particular character to that particular pure breed. So these are the different uh, ethnic communities uh, who have safeguarded the different breeds. Uh, what we saw the so many breeds, you know, Harlikar by Pindaris, Gadishi by Gujaratis, Todas, Toda, Toda people, Bunny, Bunny pastoralist. Here we have Darwad. So in this breed conservation program, one of the major thing we should do is, uh, these are the people, see different NGOs. So whoever is an NGO involved in particular breed conservation, how we can work along with them? When you propose your project, you have an NGO group also uh, into your project. And, uh, they need it because they will be uh, trickling down to the classroom they can help you in trickling down. So these are different examples of uh, the rainbow sheep you can see. Chakati, Kanni Adol, Tamil Nadu, many people are working on this. And uh, this Kangayam, they have a Senapati Kangayam cattle, the family foundation at the Kangayam gate. So this the list goes on like this. So what we can do is this type of shows. So as a mutually the Kandal has been re agriculture universities, we should conduct more and more shows. More and more cattle shows. These are some of the Pushkar Camel and uh, this Gati Subramanya and Hava. They have a lot of fish. So, this will automatically encourage people uh, to have, because once, like a dog show, if you are going to have, uh, it makes them more, uh, gives them the pride in having a particular thing. So, we should work upon whenever there is a festival or season or something, some occasion, we should have also a cattle show, not a, a, a crossbred animal to judge the individual uh, indigenous breeds also in that case, along with the uh, milk production and all.
step here ah. yes yes no 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 problem no problem yes i should stand here yeah okay okay well oh, this goes on to recording ah. in recent two years lumpy skin yes the, see the lumpy skin disease is mainly because of the flies so fly fly only spreads that so we have to break the chain by fly control as well as vaccination is there now vaccination malan gida recovered very fast they also got our herd also got uh, but we fed only during that time i i asked my uh, labor to feed a lot of uh, neem leaves neem leaves and then uh, neem leaf uh, we grinded and we pasted on its body neem and uh, turmeric Uh, it immediately cures but immaterially before the start of summer uh, you should uh, feed the animals with uh, neem leaves as well as uh, spraying spraying to control flies uh, with any of the neem product neem oil neem mixed uh, something ma madam has done she has done some with all the uh, leaves which are bitter all those were boiled in one water and then that water was extracted and put into a sprayer and it kills all the animal uh, the insects so the fly menace if it is controlled especially uh, the compost pit should be far away from the animal shed should be far away from the animal shed and uh, frequent spraying on the manure 
uh, because that is where the fly breeds. So if you are going to control the flies, automatically lumpy skin can be controlled. Uh, huh? Concentrates? In natural farming, whether we can feed concentrates or not. Uh, yeah, now you should uh, think whether it is grown with any chemicals or not, no, that you should have an idea, no, maize or maize is the 60% of the concentrate is maize, 30% will be bran, rice bran. So whether these two and then uh, another 10%, uh, 20-15% will be oil cake, okay. Again, in all these, whether they have used chemicals or not. And if you are having a native animal, I am repeatedly telling, if you have tree fodder, leguminous tree fodder, there is no need to feed concentrate at all. And where you will be very well knowing, it is grown in uh, organically. So better to encourage that. Vaccination you have to uh, adopt. You have to adopt. Because it will not have any, it will just boost the immune system. It is not a chemical which is going to be a residue in something. It is going to boost the immune system only. Only thing when uh, mineral mixture we advise uh, certain times. So again mineral mixture also can be balanced with the nourishment, feed and fodder only. Then uh, chaffing the fodder is very much uh, essential to consume the whole, see whether it has, if you are giving 30 kgs, whether all 30 kgs it has in consumed or not. So in chaffed fodder it definitely consumes, that is the thing. And again the dung of the indigenous breeds are very hard compared to the, uh, this cross brand, which less water content.